now let's use this video as a quick revision guide to refresh your understanding of the basic operation of DC machines. The starting point in your understanding of DC machines is recognizing, firstly, that a motor converts electrical energy into mechanical energy. Conversely, a generator converts mechanical energy into electrical energy. Normally, we call a machine a device which is capable of operating as either a motor or a generator. As we'll see, it's often the case that the same device can act as both, as both depending on how you excite them. So let's start with the DC motor. First, let's understand the reason a DC motor is able to convert electrical energy into movement. The Lorentz equation tells us that an electron which moves inside a magnetic field will experience a force if many such electrons inside a conductor are moving inside a magnetic field all these forces add up to something quite substantial and we begin to see that the conductor will move or in a motor spin the electrical energy which goes into producing the current i.e making the electrons move and generating the magnetic field is converted to mechanical energy because the conductor moves so your understanding of how DC motors are constructed should begin with the fact that we need to ensure that two distinct things happen. Firstly, that we have a current carrying conductor to allow the electrons to move. And secondly, that we have some way to generate a magnetic field. As long as we can make these two things happen, we have a DC motor. There are several different ways that we can do this. First, to, to generate the magnetic field, we have the basic choice of either using a permanent magnet or a coil to generate the magnetic field. If we use a coil to generate a magnetic field, we can introduce the first type of DC machine we need to understand, the separately excited DC machine. This type of motor has two separate circuits, one to generate the magnetic field, by producing a current through a winding, and second, a circuit to generate a current to produce moving electrons, um, and this we'll call the armature. Now this second circuit will need to spin, so we have to think of a way to provide current to this circuit, but also allow it to move. One way to do this is with a brush. A brush allows an electrical connection to the armature to be made but also allow it to spin. Now we soon hit another problem with this circuit. The interaction of the magnetic field with the moving electrons produced a force that has a direction. A split ring commutator is a simple solution to this. Now it should be noted here that um, all we need to do to create a DC motor is generate a magnetic field and produce a current carrying conductor that's free to spin. There are other ways to do this, including the series motor, in which the armature current and field current are in series, and the shunt motor, where the armature and field are in parallel. Uh, we can also use uh, something similar to the separately excited motor, but with a permanent magnet taking the place of the field winding. We'll look at these uh, different, different um, constructions another time. So we understand now the basic construction of a DC motor. Uh, but how does a DC motor behave when it's operating? By behave, I mean, for example, how do we control it? How can we change its speed? And how do we understand how much torque it produces and so on? we need to look at the equivalent circuit of the separately excited DC machine and derive some really important equations to help us understand how it works. Now, if we balance the voltages on the armature side of the motor, i.e. the side that spins, we can see that the electrical supply, which is on the stationary sides of the, of, of the brush, 
uh, and we'll call this uh, this voltage E, that has to be equal to the voltage drop across the armature and something that we'll call the back EMF. Now the back EMF is really important in the understanding of DC motors. Uh, when the armature spins inside a magnetic field, it generates an EMF according to Faraday's law. Now this EMF opposes the current that causes the motor to spin in the first place. So it appears in opposition to the applied voltage. Importantly, the faster the motor spins, the higher this back EMF will be. In fact, we can see that the back EMF is proportional to the speed of the motor multiplied by a constant. Uh, this constant is a, a property of the construction of the motor. We can also derive an equation for the torque of the motor. So torque is a rotational force. And in a DC motor, torque is proportionate to the armature current uh, multiplied again by a constant. So how can we use this to explain the behavior of the motor at, um, in the first instance, no load? So what does no load mean? Well, it means that there's no opposing torque when the motor spins. So let's suppose we have, um, or we apply a voltage to the armature, and we also apply a voltage to the field. So now we have both ingredients necessary for movement of the armature. So the motor will begin to spin. The speed of the motor is closely related to the strength of the field, but perhaps counterintuitively, it is also true that the motor spins faster when the field is lower and slower when the field is higher. But why is this the case? Now, answering this question is actually one of the keys to understanding how the motor works. Now, one way to explain this is if the field strength drops, the motor needs to increase its speed in order to maintain the voltage equation. This is because the back EMF, which is proportionate to the field strength, has to be maintained at the same value. The only way the motor can do this is by spinning faster, thereby compensating for the drop in field strength. Conversely, if the field strength increases, the motor will slow down, all other things being equal. So the field gives us a useful way to control the speed of the motor. This can often be achieved by, um, for example, varying the resistance in series with the field winding thereby changing the current and the induced field. But we have to be really careful because now we have this information, we have to realize that if that field is suddenly short circuit, oh, sorry, open circuited, uh, which means we have no field anymore, then the motor can spin at a dangerously high speed. So we always need to consider this um, when we think about DC motors. Now, are there any other ways that we can control the speed of the separately excited DC motor? Well, what happens if we increase the supply voltage to the armature? Well, the back EMF will need to increase to maintain the balance in, in the equation. So when the supply voltage is increased, there will be an immediate increase in armature current. So when we have an increase in armature current, that will lead to an increase in the torque. The increased torque will cause the motor to speed up, which will actually increase the back EMF. This reduces the current, so that back EMF, if that increases, that acts to inhibit that rising current, thereby reducing it until a new steady state is reached. But that new steady state will be at a higher operating speed. So we can see now that the armature voltage is another way to control the speed of the motor.